Hey everyone, today we're going to go over the game between Alice Lee and Rose Atwell from the 2023 U.S. Junior Girls Championship. Alice Lee had the white pieces and she started off with the move d4. Rose played d5 in response and white played c4. So here we have a queen's gambit and after e6 we have a queen's gambit declined. Knight c3 was played, bishop e7 and c takes d5. So exchanging these pawns in the center e takes d5 was played, and bishop f4. Black played c6 in this position, so reinforcing the pawn on d5. After c6, white played e3, and bishop d6 was played by rose. So bishop d6 is not uncommon. It's um, not the most common line, but it's definitely been seen many times. However, I don't like this move because um, basically when you play bishop d6 in this position, you've already moved this bishop to e7 once, now you're moving it again to d6, and it's basically wasting a tempo in this position. Um, after bishop d6, white played bishop takes d6, queen takes d6, and bishop d3. So developing normally, knight f6 was played, queen c2. c2 is a good square for the queen, and it also allows this queen and bishop to i the h7 pawn. So queen c2 was played, castles by black, and here white played knight g e2. White could have also played the move knight f3 instead. Um, the point of knight g e2 is that there's really two main points, is that one, with this knight on e2 instead of f3, white can potentially prepare f3 and e4 in the future, building a big center. Um, and also, white can try and play something like knight g3 and hop this knight into f5 and look at the king's side if white wants to do that instead. So that's the point of knight g e2. Um, rook e8 was played, so putting this rook on this semi-open e-file and staring down at this e-pawn to make it harder for white to get this uh, f3 and e4 break if needed. h3 was played, so just preparing uh, to castle kingside in anticipation of moves like knight g4 or bishop g4 in the future. So h3 was played. a5 was played in response. Um, you guys will see the idea behind a5 in a few moves, but basically it's um, going to stop a minority attack with uh, b4 and a3 on the queen side. So a5 was played, white castled uh, king side, and black played knight bd7. And here white plays the move rook ab1 and starts to prepare um, the attack with a3 and b4 on the queen side, um, which is why black played a5 before. After rook ab1, black goes queen e7 and a3. So the idea behind this is that in an ideal world, white would be able to play b4, and then, um, so let's say if black makes just some random moves like king h8 or something. And if white goes b4, trade on b4, and let's say black does nothing, they just shuffle. White wants to get their pawn to b5, so that eventually they can take on c6 and settle black with this uh, weak pawn on c6. And this is what's known as the minority attack, because as you can see here, all the way back, um, white has a uh, queen side minority, so they have the two pawns versus uh, black's pawns on the queen side, and so black has more pawns on the side of the board, and they have the majority, so white has the minority, and the idea is that you want to trade off, sorry, that you want to trade off um, after, let's say, king h8, some random move, you want to trade off the pawns. So you want to get in a position like this, where the c6 pawn is not protected by another pawn, and then you can sort of build pressure on it and attack it on the C file um, and try and make progress that way if you're white. That's what you want to do. So that's why uh, white's going um, B4 or trying to go B4, and that's why black played A5 to sort of prevent this. So um, after white goes A3, they're preparing the move B4. And if black just sits and does nothing, um, it can be kind of difficult to play because this minority attack is a simple yet pretty effective plan for white in these types of queen's gambit um, declined positions where white, exchange, white exchanges on d5. So after a3, uh, black really needs to figure out a way to get some counterplay. So here Rose chooses to play the move knight e4 and strike in the center. Um, knight e4 is one of those moves that is common in these positions, but it needs to be evaluated in every like specific instance. So in this position, I kind of don't like it. Uh, the reason is that after bishop takes e4, which Alice played, black has to play d takes e4. Notice that this pawn on e4 is not protected by another pawn, and it's also on the fifth rank, so it's closer to white's side of the board. And already we have two attackers on it with the knight and the queen. 
So um, here, white added another attacker with knight g3. You can start to see how it's difficult to defend this pawn. You can't play f5 because the knight attacks. So black's only move is the move knight f6. And here, white played rook fd1. So at first glance, it seems like black has this covered with a bunch of defenders. However, white is preparing to strike in the center with the move d5. After d5 is played, you can sort of uh, have some trades in the center and get rid of some crucial defenders of this pawn. This pawn will be quite weak in the future. So in order to disrupt this plan, black played the move h5, intending h4 to dislodge this knight from the g3 square, thereby removing an attacker of the e4 pawn. Also, it could potentially be used as just a way to get, gain some space on the king side. But after h5, um, Alice played the really nice move d5. She played it anyway. And the point is that when you encounter an attack on like uh, one side of the board, like a flank attack, it's really good to counterattack in the center and open it up and make these sort of uh, moves on the side of the board look a bit dubious here. So after d5, black played h4. And if white had just retreated their knight with a move like knight e2, and then they had an exchange on d5, something like this. Um, white's definitely not worse. They're definitely slightly better. Um, probably more than slightly better because of these loose pawns. However, um, white didn't want to go this way. They didn't want to simply retreat their knight. Instead, Alice played the move d6 in this position. So ignoring the threat on her knight to get this pawn to the 6th rank and attack black's queen. So this move has some um, advantages and it has some disadvantages as well. The pawn on d6 can be viewed as either an asset or a liability. In this case, it's a little bit of both. Um, basically, it, it's always threatening to kind of go to d7 and get really close to this queening square and disrupt black's position. However, this d7 square is guarded by a lot of pieces. And if white's not careful, they can get into a situation where the d6 pawn is simply unable to move forward and then it's going to get corralled by the black pieces because it's so close to the side of the board. So after d6, um, black could have played the move queen e5, uh, which is probably the my suggestion for this position. I think the reason that she didn't play queen e5, which is a, is a great move, it centralizes the queen, and after a move like knight e2, you can sort of gang up on the pawn. The reason she didn't go for this, I suspect, is because white has the move knight takes e4 in this position, taking advantage of the fact that you have this very strong d-pawn. So after knight takes e4, uh, black can go knight takes e4 and it looks like they're winning a piece, but you have d7 and these types of positions are uh, going to be equal in material. However, white's always going to be at least slightly better because of this active rook that has this open file and that is on the seventh rank. So maybe um, Rose didn't want to go for this type of position where she knew she'd have to defend a uh, at least slightly worse endgame. So instead she chose to play the move queen d8 here. Um, but I didn't really like queen d8 because it's not, um, it's not in your best interest to sort of blockade this pawn with the queen. Um, and the queen's not really doing too much on d8. I would have much rather had it on e5. Um, also queen d8 allows knight takes e4, just outright winning a pawn. But I guess her idea behind this was that after knight takes e4, knight takes e4, and white, um, recapturing with their last knight, black plays bishop f5. So at first glance... Um, this position looks like it could potentially be dangerous for white. Um, you have this pin that's not only pinning this knight to the queen, but also there's a rook behind it, so it's very dangerous. And there's already two attackers on this knight. So if white plays a move like rook d4, at the very least, uh, uh, if white plays rook d4 trying to defend this knight, at the very least, black has something like rook takes, d4, rook takes e4, rook takes e4, and queen takes d6, simply winning back the pawn and taking advantage of this pin. And it'll be uh, probably equal here. However, uh, white did not want to go for this. They played the move f3 instead. And f3 seems like it has some drawbacks because if black takes on e4, then the pawns are doubled. And normally this would be kind of okay for black and you can sort of position your pieces in a way that you can blockade these pawns and attack the weaknesses. However, this position is unique in the sense that white has already banked an extra pawn and this pawn in this specific position would be a massive asset. The d6 pawn right here um, really hinders black's ability to create counterplay and play the game that they want to play because if you try and activate your rooks and bring your queen out, suddenly you're not blockading this d6 pawn anymore and it can simply run down the board. So black always has to keep tabs on this pawn and it's likely that um, they're never going to get a real advantage in this game. They can only hope to blockade the pawn and hold on for, for some type of equality. That's why um, 
f3 was played and bishop takes e4 might be unwise. I still thought um, it'd be a good try. I also like the move rook e5, just uh, trying to gang up on this pin knight. However, here Rose blundered with the move queen g5. And at first glance, um, it's hard to see why this is a blunder. Uh, the move is a bit shocking at first because you see like the, the initial reaction is, oh, free queen, right? However, white can't take this queen because after bishop takes c2, black gets the queen back and forks these two major pieces and black's going to come out uh, at least an exchange up um, and they'll be doing very well. So you can't take the queen and because you can't take the queen, you realize, okay, black is now threatening queen takes e3 and in some positions, if they go queen g6, they can gang up on the knight more and even threaten moves like bishop takes h3 because of this pin on the g-pawn. So that's some of the advantages of queen g5. However, the problem with this move is that white has an extremely strong response that really covers all the problems, which is the move queen c5. So queen c5, what does it do? It gets out of the way of this pin. It pins this bishop now to the queen. It defends this e3 pawn, so black is no longer threatening it. Um, and now, basically, uh, white has opened up the avenue to potentially take this queen. So after queen c5, black played the move queen g6, so still taking advantage of the fact that even though white's queen is not pinned, or the knight's not pinned to the queen, uh, the rook is still there. The problem with queen g6 is that now you've moved your queen and your bishop out from the center, and this pawn has a clear avenue to march forward. So here, white plays the move d7. After d7, black has to blockade this pawn with rook e d8, and white takes the opportunity to bully black's queen and uh, get the rook in the game in the process with the move rook d6. After rook d6, black can try to go queen h7, potentially, um, but then the queen will look kind of awkward on that square, and also probably fall victim to something like knight g5. So black plays the only move, which is f6. Um, f6 stops the attack on the queen. However, it opens up the king, the king side, and makes black's king quite vulnerable. Um, and although it's not so obvious at this moment, it becomes a very big factor in the game later. So here, white played queen c4 check. The idea is that you want to defend your knight and also uh, check black's king in the process so you can sort of defend your knight with tempo. Um, here, what black should have done is probably something like queen f7 and then trade into the ending uh, where they can just try and hold on. However, um, I can understand why someone would try to go for something more active rather than a completely passive defense in an endgame where you know you just have to hold on for a draw and you can't really hope for any winning chances. So I understand why black went king h8 in this position. However, they're significantly worse. And here, uh, Alice really um, increases her advantage by playing very precisely. And it's really impressive. And it's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I wanted to show this specific game, uh, which is here she plays the move rook bd1. So what does rook bd1 do? So first, defends this d7 pawn, so it adds um, more support to it. Gets this rook on this very active d file, which is extremely useful because if you go to d4, you could potentially see an attack on this h4 pawn in the future. But what's really interesting about this move is that it hangs this h3 pawn. And after black plays bishop takes h3, which was played in the game, so bishop takes h3, uh, white, or sorry, black is threatening checkmate here. So it seems a bit scary, but Alice calmly plays the move rook uh, 1 d2. So just defending this pawn. And although black has restored material, in, uh, material equality here by winning the h3 pawn, um, they're significantly worse in this position. After a bishop takes h3 and rook d2, black retreats their bishop to f5, so potentially looking to go h3. But white simply retreats with knight f2, and now you see the real problems in black's position. This h pawn that went to h5 and then h4 long ago trying to dislodge this knight has become a huge liability in black's position. Uh, white's king is, sorry, black's king is wide open, and this h pawn, which is marched down the board, is becoming a, a problem for black. It's really easy for white to target this pawn, and once you target this pawn and maybe even win it, then black's king is going to be in huge trouble because some of these pawns on the king side have overextended themselves um, much more than they should have. So after knight f2, black played the move queen g3, so sort of defending the pawn. Note that uh, going h3, in this position would not be wise because queen h4 check is a big problem and then um, white can really just pick up this pawn at will and then we'll have a crushing advantage in this position so that's why black decided to defend this pawn with queen g3 um, after queen g3 was played white played the move rook 6d4 so putting more pressure on this pawn 
And at this point in the game, you really have to think about, okay, do I defend this pawn? Do I push the pawn up the board? What do I do with it? If you play h3, this would be very bad because rook h4 check forces bishop h7. Note that the g8 square is covered by the queen on c4. So after bishop h7 is forced, white well, can simply take on h3, and then white's going to be up a pawn. They have this monster pawn on d7. Um, black's position looks terrible. Their king is in a terrible spot, and the bishop is pinned. So this would be a disaster for black. So they don't want to do that. So the other options were either to let the pawn fall, which would be um, very dangerous because it just allows white to utilize this h file. And the last option is to defend this pawn with the move g5, which is what black chose. So after g5, you're momentarily defending your pawns, and it seems like you're, you're keeping material equality here. However, g5 comes with one massive drawback, which is the fact that it opens up the king even more. And now the, the fact that these pawns have moved so far down the board on the king's side um, is really detrimental to black's position. And Alice uh, finds a way to exploit this these problems and convert her advantage uh, with insane accuracy here. She was really accurate with her moves. She started with the move queen f7. So simply diving the queen into black's position and attacking this f6 pawn. So black noticed that if they go with something like queen e5 to defend the pawn, white's simply going to go rook d6 and put more pressure. So passive defense might not be the way to go here. She chose, or Rose chose to try some, some active moves to try and create some counterplay. So she played the move h3. So h3 threatens uh, queen takes g2 checkmate and also maybe h2 in some cases. So that was the point behind h3. However, white can play queen takes f6 with check, which is important that it comes with check so that no mate is allowed uh, on g2. And king g8 was played. And here white plays knight takes h3, giving up a piece, but doesn't matter because Alice Lee had calculated this all the way through. After knight takes h3, bishop takes h3. Looks like black's up a piece, but only temporarily, because although you can't take this bishop back because of the pin, white has a nice forcing sequence with starting with the move, queen g6 check. After queen g6 check, black goes uh, king f8. If they go to the h file, then you can simply pick up the bishop or just swing the rooks down and then um, continue the mating attack. So after king f8, white plays the move rook d6. So you're still down a piece. If you're white here, however, you're threatening all sorts of things, uh, mainly rook f6 check and then queen f7 mate. So black plays the only move to counteract this, which is the move rook takes d7. After rook takes d7, white goes rook takes d7, bishop takes d7, and it looks like white can just take the bishop and then have like a million different mating ideas and then black should just resign. However, rook takes d7 would, would be a very bad mistake. Uh, it would waste all, the, all of white's hard work because here, Black has a perpetual check with the move queen e1 check and queen h4. And then this would simply be a repetition and it, the game would end in a draw. And certainly white wants no part of this because they've worked so hard to, to start this attack on the king. So here Alice plays a very precise move, which is queen h6 check. After queen h6 check, note that you are covering the h4 square. So here uh, black actually played king g8 and after rook takes d7, Black resigned because there's simply no way to deal with all the threats. You're dealing with imminent mate threats of all sorts of all sorts of threats here. So the only way to fight on would be something like queen e1 check, king h2, and then queen h4, accepting a, an ending like this. But after trading the queens, white would win the b pawn, and then white's up two pawns. They'd be these two connected passers, and black's pawns are so split, and um, like white's pieces are in the perfect positions, and, and black's King could not be any worse here, just cut off by this rook on the 7th, that this would be such an easy win for white. White's already up two connected pawns, and they just pick up all the pawns, and they would convert the game. So that's why black resigned after a queen h6 check and rook takes d7, um, because there's simply no way to deal with the threats. And if your best shot is the ending, which is lost, then um, yeah, resignation uh, is not... It w resignation was in order. It's not too bad of an option. So after... Uh, Queen h6 and rook takes c7, black resigned. I did want to go through one more thing, which is that if black goes the other way with king e8 trying to defend the bishop and retain the piece, then white can play queen h8 check, king e7. You don't take the rook because then queen e1 check picks up this rook and you might even lose this game. You play queen g7 check, then wherever the king goes, you can take on d7 with check and 
once you take all these pieces with check, you can continue this mating attack and it's going to be all over. White's up material and Black's King is wide open, so uh, White would be clearly winning this game and Mate would follow shortly. So that's why Black went uh, to G8 instead. And after Rook takes D7, once again, uh, Rose at will resign in this position and Alice Lee won a very nice game where she played very accurately and showed some, some really nice skills in this game. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed this game and learned something from it. I'll be out with more videos soon, but until then, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.